11, 28. Woe unto you who are rich, Luke 6, 24. It is only with difficulty that those who have riches can enter into the kingdom of God, Luke 18, 24. Riches are a temptation and a snare. The rich are liable to, to foolish and hurtful lusts, which end in, in ruin. For the love of money is the root of all evil. First Timothy 6, 9-10. In the intertestamental literature, there is the same note. Woe to you who acquire silver and gold in unrighteousness. They shall perish in their possessions, and in, in shame will their spirits be cast into the furnace of fire. He notes 97, 8. In the wisdom of Solomon, there is a a savage passage in which the stage makes the selfish rich speak of their own way of life compared with that of the righteous come on therefore let us enjoy the good things that are present and let us speedily use created things like as in youth let us fill ourselves with costly wine and ointments and let no flower of the spring pass by us let us crown ourselves with rosebuds before they shall pass through it. Let none of us go without his part of our voluptuousness. Let us leave tokens of our joyfulness. Let us oppose the poor righteous man. Let us spare, the, let us not spare the widow, nor reverence the ancient gray hairs of the aged. Therefore, let us lie in wait for the righteous because he is not for our turn and is clean contrary to our doings. He upbraideth us with our offering of the law and objected to our infirmity, the sins of our ways of life. Okay, that's Solomon 2, 6 to 12. One of the mysteries of social thought is how religion, at least the Christian religion, ever came to be regarded as the Oplate of the poor, opiate of the poor, or how is it ever came to seem an otherworldly affair which neglected this world to concentrate on some world to come? There is no book in any literature with such a burning social passion as the Bible. There's no book which speaks so explosively and dramatically of social wrongs and social injustice. There's no book so burningly conscious that the great gap between riches and poverty is an active and terrible transgression of the law of God and the will of God. There is no book which has, in fact, proved so powerful a social dynamic as the Bible has. The Bible does not condemn wealth as such, but there is no book which more strenuously insists on the responsibility of wealth and on the perils which surround a man who is abundantly blessed with this worldly goods. Okay, open for discussion. Well, it seems but not much has changed between then and now as far as as far as the conflict between the haves and have-nots. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Well, you know, of course, opiate of the people is a phrase lifted from Karl Marx's writings. Yes. I'm not sure if it appears in Das Kapital, but someplace he used yeah, that phrase. But it does. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, uh, there's a, a book by, I think the, you probably know who he is, Pastor. I think the, the theologian's name was Niebauer, and he wrote a book. I think it's, I have a copy. I think it's Justice and Mercy that addresses this topic. The book, by the way, was a, a favorite of Jimmy Carter's, or is a favorite of Jimmy Carter's. But uh, yeah, as Robert says, still a, still a burning topic. Actually, uh as I look at social affairs and what's going on, um, I see us much closer to the time of Christ or right after Christ 
in the social uh, dynamics of things. Um, I think we've come full circle. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting that it is with the, the blessings that we receive that we are tempted to go against God's will. Um, riches are for use and serving others and um, at one time the, the uh, those who were greatly wealthy saw a responsibility to make work for um, society itself that was what capital was for it was not for hoarding um, it was for creating of things and if you look at the in the Great Depression, and you look at what was created during the Great Depression to create work, uh, you see that that tragedy of, of uh, economic loss was also used to bless future generations. I don't know if we can say that right now. I think that... Well, I think... I somebody who gives away their wealth that's got all this money and then turns around and makes an effort to give it away that's that's a, a good thing well a philanthropy has never been a bad thing unless it conditions people to expect that of others if it comes from the individual he's motivated to do good then you know for him at least, it, it is something that he sees as creative work of sharing the blessing and enjoying, you know, the effect that it has on others. While um, the attempt to amass and to control and have power over people, that's a whole nother story. You know, the we look at back at people in the, in the Bible, I find it interesting. I mean, in Solomon, we're finding, you know, uh, much of what we read today about, uh, you know, condemning those who had wealth. And yet Solomon was well, probably one of the richest men in the world. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not the blessing, it's um, how the blessing is used and whether it you know, it is used to share. Um, when you look at the overall um, effort <coughs> for those who work to, you know, to, to do those things which are right in society um, and are blessed with wealth, um, those people we can look up to. But if they're, they're doing it to gain power over us, that's another story. And quite frankly, the way of the world is power, wealth, um, and uh, dominance over others. That's the sinful man. So one system is creative, the other so also but it's the way of men we use what they have and how they look for things that uh, I think creates the, the blessing of wealth. Um, let's leave it at there and go on with this. Okay, the way of selfishness and its end. Um, Dave, you want to take that? Yeah. Look you, the pay of the reapers who reaped your estates, the pay kept back from them by you cries against you, and the cries of those who reaped have come to the ears of the Lord of hosts. On the earth you have lived in soft luxury and played the wanton. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You condemned, you killed the righteous man, and he does not resist you. Here is condemnation of self, selfish riches and warning of where they must end. 
the, the selfish, selfish, selfish rich have gained their health by injustice. The Bible is always sure that the laborer is worthy of his hire. The day laborer in Palestine lived on a very verge of starvation. His wage was small. It was impossible for him to save anything. And if the wage was withheld from him, even for a day, he and his family simply could not eat. That is why the merciful laws of scripture again and again insist on the prompt payment of his wages to the hired laborer. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy. You shall give him his hire on the day he earns it before the sun goes down, for he is poor and sets his heart upon it, lest he cry against, against you to the Lord, and it be sin in you. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. Do not say to your neighbor, Go and come again tomorrow. I will give it when you have it with you. Woe to him that builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages. Those that oppress the hire, hireling in his wages are under the judgment of God. He had taketh away his neighbor's living. The breath, the bread gotten by sweat slayeth him, and that defraudeth the laborer of his hire, defraudeth his maker, and shall receive a bitter reward. For he, he is brother to him that is a blood bloodshedder. Let not the wages of any man which hath wrought for thee tarry with thee, but give it to him out of, the, out of hand. The law of the Bible is nothing less than the, the charter of the laboring man. The social concern of the Bible speaks in the words of the law and of the prophets and of the sages alike. Here it is said that the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. The hosts are the hosts of heaven, the stars and the heavenly powers. It is teaching of the Bible in, in its every part that the Lord of the universe is concerned for the rights of the laboring man. The selfish rich have used their wealth selfishly. They have lived in soft luxury and have played the wanton. The word translated to live in soft luxury is trupian, trupan, trupine. It comes from a root which means to break down. And it describes the soft living which is the which in the end saps and destroys a man's moral fiber. The word translated to play the wanton is uh, spatulin. It is a much worse word. It means to live in lewdness and I don't know what that word is. Lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. It is the condemnation of the selfish rich that they have used their possessions to gratify their own love of comfort and to satisfy their own lusts, and that they have forgotten all duty to the, their fellow men. But anyone who chooses this pathway has also chosen its end. The end of specially fattened cattle is that they will be slaughtered for some feast. And those who have sought this easy luxury and selfish wantonness are like men who have fattened themselves for the day of judgment. The end of their pleasure is grief, and the goal of their luxury is death. Selfishness always leads to the destruction of the soul. The selfish rich have slain the unresisting, unresisting righteous man. 
It is doubtful to whom this refers. It could be a reference to Jesus. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. It is, it is Stephen's charge that the Jews always slew God's messengers even before the coming of the just one. It is, it is Paul's declaration that God chose the Jews to see the just one, although they rejected him. Peter says that Christ suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust. The suffering servant of the Lord offered no resistance. He opened not his mouth, and like a sheep before his shears, he was dumb. A passage which Peter quotes in his picture of Jesus. It may well be that James is saying that in their oppression of the poor and the righteous man, the selfish rich have crucified Christ again. Everyone, every wound that selfishness inflicts on is on Christ's people is another wound inflicted on Christ. It may be that James is not specially thinking of Jesus when he speaks about the righteous man, but of the evil man's instinctive hatred of, a, of the good man. We have already quoted the passage in the Wisdom of Solomon, which describes the, the conduct of the rich. That passage goes on. He, the, the righteous man, professeth to have the knowledge of God, and he calleth himself the child of the Lord. He was made to reprove our thoughts. He is grievous unto us even to behold, for his life is not like other men's. His ways are of another fashion. We are esteemed of him as counterfeits. He abstaineth from our ways as from filthiness. He pronounced the end of the just to be blessed and maketh his boast that God is his father. Let us see if his words be true. And let us prove what shall happen in the end of him. For if the just man be the son of God, he will help him and deliver him from the hand of his enemies. Let us examine him with despitefulness and torture, that we may know his meekness and prove his patience. Let us condemn him with a shameful death, or by his own saying he shall be respected. These, says the sage, are the words of men whose wickedness has blinded them. Alcibiades, the, the friend of Socrates, for all his great talents, other, often lived a riotous and debauched life. And there were times when he said to Socrates, Socrates, I hate you. For every time I see you, you show me what I am. The evil man would gladly eliminate the good man, for he reminds him of what he is and of what he ought to be. Okay. What, uh, anybody have any comments for this section? Well, we take this, we think of you know, the rich people in in the United States, like Zuckerberg or, you know, all of, all of the folks that we see that are billionaires and who are now giving away some of their fortunes and stuff. That's what we think about when we are reading this. But if you've ever been to a third world country, this applies to us as citizens of the United States. We are so rich compared to the rest of the world um, that it's remarkable. And we don't even recognize it if we've not been there to see it. So, you know, it, it's, it's not just, you know, the wealthy people in the United States that have billions and billions of dollars. It's, it's us. It's our regular, the regular citizens of the U.S. who are 
so rich. We are so blessed and we don't even know it. I remember uh, seeing some statistics and like saying that uh, if you had a roof over your head and running water in your house, you were living better than better than 90% of the world. Now that was several years ago that I saw that, but I don't think that's changed much. The uh, pandemic's effects on the, the four sections of the populace uh, has been horrendous. And uh, I guess if, if you were sit in that category where you see all that and say, thank God it's time I'm not in that, uh, you may be missing the point. That uh, thank God we have those that we can in fact help in time of need. That's uh, a lot of the problem with sin is that it turns and twists us both ways. The devil has both hands on us trying to uh, get us to, you know, give up on our faith. Either we're not worthy of being saved or how can there be a God that allows this? Um, both of those are temptations to not trust God and not love our neighbor as ourselves. We have the opportunity to do that, and that's uh, where we should be. And where is God in all this? He's right where the pain and suffering is. He's working to try to save those that he can. Let's move on then to James 5, 7, and 9, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Um, Robert, do you want to take that? Robert? Robert, you're muted. You'll need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm muted. Yes. Okay. How about now? Yeah, your yes. sound coming up okay. good. Okay, brothers, have patience until the coming of the Lord. Look, you, the farmer, waits for the precious fruit of the earth, patiently waiting for it until it receives the earth until we see the early and late rains. So do you too be patient. Make firm your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Brothers, do not complain against each other that you may not be condemned. Look you, the judge stands at the door. The early church lived in the expectation of the immediate second coming of Jesus Christ. And James exhorts his people to wait with patience for the few years which remain. The former has to wait for his crops until the early and late rains have come. The early and late rains are often spoken of in Scripture, for they were all important to the farmer of Palestine. The early rain was the rain in was the rain in late October and early November. Without it, without it, the seed which had been sown would not germinate at all. The late rain was the rain of April and May, without which the grain would not mature. The farmer needs patience to wait until nature does her work. And the Christian needs patience to wait until Christ comes. During that waiting, they must confirm their faith. They must not blame one another for the troubles of the situation in which they find themselves or if they do, they will be breaking the commandment which forbids Christians to judge one another. And if they break that commandment, they will be condemned. Jesus has no doubt of the nearness of the coming of Christ. The judge is at the door, he says, using a phrase which Jesus himself had used. It so happened that the early church was mistaken, that Jesus Christ did not return within a generation of men. But it will be of interest to gather up the teaching of the New Testament about the second coming 
that we may see the essential truth at the heart of it. We may first know that the New, that the New Testament uses three different words to describe the second coming of Jesus Christ. The commonest word is the word parousia, a word which has come into English as it stands. It is used in Matthew, Thessalonians, Corinthians, John, and Peter. It is in ordinary secular Greek, it, this is the ordinary word for someone's presence or arrival. But it has two other usages, usages which can become quite technical. It is used. It is used of the invasion of a country by an army, and especially it is used of the visit of a king or a governor to the province of his empire. So then, when this word is used of Jesus, it means that the Perusia, the second coming of Christ, is the final invasion of Earth by heaven, and the coming of the King is to receive the final submission and adoration of his subjects. The New Testament also uses the word Epiphania, Nia, of the, of the second coming of Christ in Titus, Timothy, and Thessalonians. In ordinary Greek, this word has two special use, usage. Is it is used of the it is used of the appearance of of a god to his worshiper, and is used of the accession of an emperor to the imperial power of Rome. So when this word is used of Jesus, it means that his epiphania, his second coming, is God appearing to his people, to both those who are waiting for him and to those who are rebelling against him and disregarding him. It is God at last mounting the throne of his universe with his last enemy subdued. Finally, the New Testament uses the word apocalypsis, apocalypsis of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The word apocalypsis Apocalypsis is ordinary in ordinary Greek means an unveiling or laying bare. And when this word is used of the second coming of Jesus, it means that the coming is the laying of is laying bare, the full displaying, the unveiling of power and the glory of God coming upon men. Here then we have a series of great pictures. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the arrival of the king. Is God appearing to his people and mounting his eternal throne? It is God directing on the on the world the full blaze of his heavenly glory. Okay, with that do we have any comments? Uh, well uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, the the three phrases in Eastern Orthodox circles, Greek and Russian circles, the word most often used to describe or discuss the second coming would be parousia, the first one. And then uh, epi epiphania, of course, that's you know related to our phrase epiphany. That's uh, more kind of a personal realization, of course, of uh, what's going on in the including the eminence of the second coming. And I've noticed that the, the printer or Barclay always uses this U uh, to uh, uh, for the, the the Roman U for the Greek U in, in the translation, which is misleading. So it's just apocalypse or apocalypse, which, uh, you know, is kind of the end time pr uh, prediction. But it's confusing because he, he transliterates it with that U, and that's, it's really an I sound that that is there. So... Uh, well, it looks like a U in Greek also. Maybe that's why he does it. But it's uh, Apocalypsis, the Apocalypse, which we're you know pretty much familiar with is the the end time. I think we were all around studying Revelation. So. Well, and that's the book is called the uh, Apocalypse, the the unveiling, the the vision that was opened up 
uh, giving us a picture of the end times. Parousia also has the, the connections of the word paradise to it, though. Um, no, part paradise is paradise. Yeah. Um, so, what do you say about this? The text that, that says that he is coming soon or coming quickly. Well, I mean, I think we've had the discussion in Barclay, you know, uh, I think mentions it as well here and elsewhere, but, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's the observation that the, the first generation Christians expected, uh, you know, Christ to come back within their lifetime. But what I was taught by my, you know, spiritual fathers and others was that, uh, when uh, Christ refers to, when he says, there are those standing here uh, who will not die before they see me come in my glory, that when Christ came in all his glory was when he was crucified on Golgotha. That was his yes. glory. Yes. You know, taking in our sins and dying for the sins of the world. I know, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I've watched a lot, you know, my share of religious documentaries, and there was this one that kind of caught my attention. It was about a, it was about a preacher. He's a Protestant preacher, evangelical preacher in in Quebec, Canada. And uh, you know the, the population there is mostly Roman Catholic, French Roman Catholic, so uh, French Canadian Roman Catholic. So I, I understand what he's doing. I get what he's doing. He wants to present an alternative, a worship alternative to Roman Catholicism, and he sees Roman Catholicism as you know, too ritualistic, too formalized, and not having enough connection with the people. Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. But then he goes on to say that when he looks in the Roman Catholic Church, he sees, um, you know, images, statuary of the crucifix of Christ dying, bleeding on the cross. And he says, now, if people want, want a, a, a Christ that can do something for them, what can this Christ do for them? Right? And my reaction, although I'm not a Roman Catholic, is when I see Christ dying on the cross, that's about all that can be done for me, right? That's about all that can be done for me, right? It's a sacrifice, right? I don't think that, that it, you know, that, that uh, I or anybody else can expect Christ to do anything more for me than than that. So anyway, yeah, that, that, uh, that, that second coming that, that, you know, I was taught, well, when, he, when, 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 he, when that crowd saw him coming in all his glory, that was him, him dying on Golgotha on the cross. Yes, and we will see him come in all his glory with the holy angels um, on the last day. But uh, we should all understand that we will see Christ in our lifetime. Uh, uh, whether whether it's from our, at that point of our death or whether it's his second coming. At, at our death, uh, you know, we go to be in the presence of God. And uh, so if you look at it from that perspective, it's short. And it is coming. And uh, well, the pandemic should certainly make us aware of the fact that we're mortal. Yeah, we're, we'll all have our end, end time. We'll all uh, have our apocalypse. Yeah. As well, far as... As far as that pastor in Canada, obviously he does not have a good understanding of atonement. The well, he, he was trading on the he was trading on the notion of of uh, you know the evangelical emphasis on the personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and uh, I think that you know for. At least for Orthodox people and Roman Catholics, and I think to a great extent Lutherans and Episcopalian uh, believers, I mean, the emphasis is more on the group or corporate identification with Jesus Christ. As my, my teacher, you know, told me, you know, one Christian is no Christian, right? That's why we're all together this morning, right? 
And uh, it's not anything we, we kind of participate in alone or in a corner in our, in our room. I guess we could, but it's certainly enhanced by the, the you know, the experience fellowshipping with other believers. But I think, I, I think where he was going with that, to be fair, was maybe, well, there's this personal relationship. And, and with this personal relationship, you know, I can ask Christ to do things for me or with me. I can ask him. I can ask his help in helping me find a job or helping my child to, you know, get better grades or helping my child recover from an injury, that sort of thing. I think that's possibly, to be fair, where he was going with that. But, you know, to say that, you know, the Christ on the cross was an example of somebody who couldn't, couldn't do anything for us. I'm not, you don't know about that. I think he's, Christ did everything that could be done for us on the cross. Yeah, but it's also on the uh looking and not you know, it's describing from uh, the, the worldly view you know he's helpless up there he can't come down well he couldn't come down if he was going to save us and the, the, the scriptures were to be fulfilled and of course the scriptures cannot be broken but it wasn't because he was weak he was God on the cross he, he, God didn't stop being, uh, Christ didn't stop being God when he was on that cross. Amen. Okay. Well, well, uh, let me, well, I have another thought. I mean, okay. true. We're not, you know, the second coming, we think of Jesus coming in the clouds with his angels, but for each of us personally, when we partake of communion, Jesus is coming to us in that sense also. I mean, we're partaking of really? his, his body and his blood. So, you know, it, it, we don't have to wait for that big final, you know, either us dying and being standing in front of him or for him coming in the clouds. I mean, yeah, Jesus Mark, is not, not far from us ever. No, and that, uh, you know, going back to the sacrament, uh, the sacrifice actually taking place on on uh, Golgotha, being you know part of His presence, should never be truncated with Jesus just coming to us with the Lord's Supper. That is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all are present, and that's why we called it the real presence. Well, I, I think that's you know you know well. Uh, certainly you know well stated and it's something that you know if we can prepare we can do weekly in, in most of our churches but you know kind of looking back at these early christians that were expecting the imminent coming of christ what i've read about the early christians in the first century second century whatever and been taught is that uh they oftentimes took the eucharist on a daily basis yeah. And their their leader their leaders encouraged them to do that, and uh, I don't know if that gave them a different take on it. It may have given them a different take on things than we have. Well, I think that their desire to take it uh, may have shown a, a more uh, demanding understanding that they were receiving Christ and receiving God by that. Um, and certainly the forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. Life was not easy then either. Well, let's go on to the last section uh, for today. That's uh, the coming of the king. Uh, Susan, you want to take that? Yeah, I can try. I'm having trouble with my connection, so I may drop in and out here. The coming of the king, James 5, 7 through 9. We may now gather up briefly the teachings of the New Testament about the second coming and the various uses it makes of the idea. One, the New Testament is clear that no one knows the day or the hour when Christ will come again. 
So sacred, in fact, is the time that Jesus himself does not know it. It is known right. only to God, Matthew and Mark. From this basic fact, one thing is clear. Human speculation about the time of the second coming is not only useless, it's blasphemous. For surely no one should seek to gain knowledge which is hidden from Jesus Christ himself and exists only in the mind of God. Two, the one thing that the New Testament does say about the second coming is that it will be as sudden as the lightning and as unexpected as a thief in the night. Matthew, Thessalonians, and Peter. We cannot wait to get ready when it comes. We must be ready for its coming. So the New Testament urges certain duties upon the Christian. One, they must be constantly on the watch. They are like servants whose masters has gone away and who, not knowing when he will return, must have everything ready for his return, whether it comes in the morning, at midday, or in the evening. Two, long delay may not produce despair or forgetfulness. God does not see time as human beings do. To him, a thousand years are just the same as a period on which, uh, as a period on watch in the night. And even if the years pass on, it does not mean that he has either changed or abandoned his design. Three, the time given to prepare for the coming of the king must be used. Christians must be sober, First Peter. They must strengthen themselves in holiness, 1 Thessalonians. By the grace of God, they must become blameless in body and spirit. <coughs> they must put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light now that the night is far gone and the day is near, Romans. They must use the time given to them to make themselves such that they can greet the coming of the king with joy and without shame. Four, when that time comes, they must be found in fellowship. Peter uses the thought of the second coming to urge people to love and mutually hosp hospitality. Paul commands that all things be done in love. The Lord is at hand. He says, that our forbearance must be known to all because the Lord is at hand. The word translated as forbearance is sepikas, which means the spirit that is more ready to offer forgiveness than to demand justice. The writer to the Hebrews demands mutual help, mutual Christian fellowship and mutual encouragement because the day is coming near. The New Testament is sure that in view of the coming of Christ, we must have our personal relationships right with our neighbors. The New Testament would urge that we should never end a day with an unhealed rift between ourselves and another person in case Christ should come in the night. Five, John uses the second coming as a reason for urging people to abide in Christ. Surely the best preparation for meeting Christ is to live close to him every day. Much of the imagery attached to the second coming is Jewish and is part of the traditional apparatus of the last things in ancient Jewish thought. There are many things which we are not meant to take literally, but the great truth behind all the temporary pictures of the second coming is that this world is not purposeless, but that it is going somewhere, that there is one divine far off event to which the whole creation moves. Your thoughts on this? Well, we know how we're supposed to live and how we are supposed to prepare for this event. But we also know that we uh, fall short. 
And even though we should be joyous at the second coming, it still might be a scary event, even even for Christians. Well, that's where um, we understand ourselves to be uh, unworthy servants. And at the same time, we trust God that what he has said and promised we will receive. All this idea of must really needs to be should, could, would, might. Um, that's the way it should be looked at. That if demands for salvation are that Christ died for our sins, that we be baptized and that we trust God and we receive his sacraments. Uh, and then those all are given for the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. So we need to, you know, we're almost getting into what appears Puritan in writing here. All of it true. All of it things we should strive for. But even after striving for all of that, you pointed it out, Robert, that we are poor and worthy servants. We don't live up to those standards as we, we should. And quite frankly, um, I think the devil would take that portion that uh, where we're trying to uh, live in accordance with God's will and try to use it to, to beat us up with it and cause us to lose faith and trust. And so in the end, it all really boils down to trusting God that his promises are true and that he'll keep his word. He always has, he has, and he always will do. No, that's that's Job again who says, though he slay me, I will trust him. How come the apostles know so much about the end of times when it's only God that uh, knows when the end of times is. Well, don't forget, Christ taught them what the signs would be and what they should see for the coming, um, that the Holy Spirit is leading those who are writing to put the words down that they have concerning it. Um, so I think they're trustworthy and true, for they are inspired by his Holy Spirit. What we need carefully to do is to look at those words and understand that they are for our good and for us to be looking forward to what is going to happen and by trusting God that he will make all those things, all the things that he has promised come true to us, both here in time and hereafter in eternity. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I just had a thought. There, when the author here talks about this uh, first century Jewish imagery about the end times and the second coming, uh, I was reminded, you know, the, the Bible mentions that the, you know, that distinguishes, or the New Testament distinguishes between the Pharisees and the, as these kind of legal experts and mentions that the Sadducees were people, were a group that didn't believe in the resurrection. Yeah. So when, when I would read this, I would used to think, well, shame on you, Sadducees. You're a bunch of materialistic uh, agnostics. But then I was reading a, a historical piece just recently, and it reminded me that the Sadducees actually believed in the life of the soul after death. They believed in the afterlife. They simply didn't believe in a physical resurrection. So just to, I don't know if anybody's interested in that. <laughs> That's what part of this, this ancient Jewish tradition and imagery that the Sadducees yeah. actually did. The Sadducees actually did believe in an afterlife. It was, it wasn't this, you know, this physical resurrection and restoration. Yeah, but it does. In following that, the Sadducees also lean much towards Greek mythology. Um, 
uh, and then Philo. Which also believed in an afterlife. <laughs> yes. Well, they, 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 you know, they had uh, uh, a cycle of life, basically. And, um, you know, being in the flesh is, doesn't matter. Um, much of the heresies and the false teachings of the, the past uh, are still very much present here in our day. Uh, it just keeps coming around, it's packaged in different forms, but it's always the same thing. Uh, one is, oh, if you do good things, yeah, you know, then you're good. Uh, Christianity, true Christianity says that's not true. Goodness is with God. Uh, good works are worked through God. Those things that are acceptable in his sight are the things that are worked through Christ. Uh, the rest, the, the world, the left-hand kingdom, uh, that's God's alien work. And uh, quite frankly, we don't know the mind of God, never will, um, except that which he reveals to us. And trying to go beyond that only leads us into areas where uh, faith is destroyed. So philosophy is always false teaching. It leads away. Exciting and interesting. But that's because uh, we're simul simultaneously saints and sinners. Well, um, that's pretty much our day for today. Anybody got anything else they want to add before we close it out?